Greetings, I'm Debbie Talbert Duggar, the author of Writing Solo. Thanks for joining me for this solo chat. In March of 2020, schools across the nation closed and the world got very still as we learned of the coronavirus and its havoc on public education, commerce, travel, and our lives in general. During that time, I connected with other educators who ride. And for this educator, my motorcycle probably saved my sanity in that period of what I consider crisis teaching and learning. I connected with these three women who are also readers of my book, Writing Solo, and we uh, commiserated and uh, shared ideas, shared concerns, shared frustrations on uh, social media, emails, and so forth. So I thought it would be a um, interesting idea to get these women together and uh, talk to them about this past uh, two and a half, three years of crisis teaching and learning. So lean in and listen as I speak to educators who ride. Educators who ride, thanks ladies for joining me. And just so our uh, viewers know, or my viewers know, I have Diane who's in Minnesota, Fane who is in upstate New York, and Tracy who's in Texas. Uh, we are all educators and we are all educators who ride. So I thought it'd be interesting to get us together and talk about um, how we got started writing. And then we'll segue into the big question is, how did writing help you keep your sanity in uh, the last few years of what I call crisis teaching? Uh, Tracy, how did you start writing and what age? Um, I, about four years ago. And I originally started writing, not really, not intending to really ride my own, so to speak. Um, my husband and I had been going on long trips on his bike and I was happily riding as a passenger and got to thinking one time, you know, if we ever go somewhere and he's not feeling well or something happens, I can't move this bike if I have to, you know, when you go on a car trip, obviously, if you're with another person and someone doesn't feel well, you can take over or whatever you can eat you can trade out. Um, I didn't feel like I was an equal partner. So I, didn't, I felt like I needed to be able to carry my weight if I needed to. Um, my husband was going to buy me a uh, little inexpensive bike to learn on, but I talked him instead into letting me take the Harley class. Um, Cause I said, you know, it's cheaper than a $3,000 bike. It's 250 bucks. I might hate it. Um, so I took the class, did the classroom part. And then the first day on the, the range, when you're actually riding, you know, circles in the parking lot, um, he came out about midday to see me and it was when they had just first let us start riding the big perimeter of the parking lot. And I didn't know he was there. He hadn't told me that he was there yet. And he said he could tell by the grin on my face. He looked at one of his buddies. He goes, damn it, I'm going to buy a bike. And <laughs> yeah. that's okay. it. Now, now you're, you're there and you're, you have two bikes, don't you? Um, I do. We're going to probably sell my heritage because I don't ride it as much anymore because I, I, I ride the street glide more. I, I like to go on the long trips. So um, we're going to probably sell it because it, I mean, it just doesn't get ridden near enough. So that's too um, bad. But yeah, currently I have two. Yeah. Fane, how did you start writing? Um, it's a little bit similar story. Uh, my sister-in-law said to me, she goes, do you want to take the class? because both the boys have bikes and what happens if something happens and we need to ride the bike or someone needs to take care of the bike. So I said, sure. I had no intentions of really riding myself either. So I went into the class, took the class uh, through our uh, college, our SUNY college. And um, the first day we were on the bike, I'm going around and I'm like, maybe this, maybe this wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> And even to the point where I said to the guy next to me, I said, am I making you nervous? He goes, no, no. And I'm thinking, I'm making me nervous. I was a little, was like, maybe it wasn't the right thing. But that second day, it's, it just clicked. And that was it. And by the end of that second day, I'm like, what am I doing on the back? I'm hmm. on my own. And a week later, we went and got me my own bike. And Good that for you. From there. So 2010 is when I started. Good for you. And uh, Diane, what's your, I got started a writing story. So I was riding on the back with hubby. He had a road king at the time and I loved it. I'd never ridden on a motorcycle before. And I just thought this was like the best thing ever. Well, at one time we got into a kind of an accident. We were rear-ended and we just kind of went, boop, 
you know, because it was just a slight little hit. And I thought, oh, well, that wasn't so bad. Huh, maybe I should give this a try. So I, <laughs> it made me not so scared. I thought I'd be you know, smushed and crushed, but we were just like, boop. So I took the Harley class like you guys did. The first day was beautiful sunshine. I loved it. It was great. I dumped the bike. That's okay. It was a small little thing. But um, the next day it rained. It just, it poured and it was so cold and it was so scary and I was soaking wet, but I, then it dried up a little bit and I did pass. And the, the instructor said, well, you passed. So I think I must have just barely passed. She said, get a small bike and practice a lot. So I, I wasn't convinced yet that I should really get a bike, but we started looking. And, and then we found this gorgeous bike. Oh, it's, yeah. It's a 98 Heritage Springer. And I was like, oh, I have to buy that bike. That's so beautiful. I love that bike. And what did I know? I, I didn't know if it would be heavy or hard to ride or anything. I, and plus, I thought, you know what? I'm old because this was like 10 years ago. I have to just get a big one because I don't have years and years to build up. Mm -hmm. So we got that bike and I rode it. It was at the end of the season and I loved riding. I did everything wrong that you could possibly do wrong on it, but I realized I really loved riding. Mm -hmm. So that winter I actually bought a new Harley, um, a heritage again, a beautiful white one. And that was it. I love it. I love it. I now have a street glide. Yes. Yep. Street yeah. glide. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Then she, she's I a also... fashionista on the motorcycle too. Not not just her vintage shoes. Oh, look at <laughs> Here's that. my. Aww. I have two bikes. Also, I have a street glide and a heritage. So I took the bags off of this one. That's one of my cute grandkids. And uh, so I put the street glide into storage in the winter and then I keep the heritage at home so I can just look at it and sit on it. And if we possibly have a slightly warm day without snow and ice, mm -hmm. I can take it out yep. for a little ride. <laughs> That's right. It's always there ready and plugged in and ready to go. <laughs> yes. And uh, for my viewers, there's going to be a quiz at the end here and you'll have to decide which one of us is the elementary school teacher. <laughs> We can always tell. Teachers can tell. Teachers can tell. <laughs> you know, I that is. I was fifty-two when I first started. Bought my first bike. I've been jumping on the back of a boy's motorcycle since I was about fifteen years old. So I, I think uh, women's stories are very similar. Is that most of us started out as passengers? Uh, you know, some women were fortunate enough to to just you know get on there and ride from the get go. But I was not. I started out as a passenger. Um, March of 2020, school shut down across the nation, and uh, we were all thrown into crisis mode in terms of teaching. What was it like for you, and how did your motorcycle um, carry you through? Tammy? You, you want me to go first? Sure. Okay, sure. Um, kind of quite funny, actually, because um, March of 2020, when I really found out that schools were shutting down, I was actually in Florida. Um, it was during spring break. My husband and I had decided um, I'd had my heritage for just a couple months. And before that, I had been riding on three wheels. I actually had a trike. So I was still kind of new to two wheels, um, but loving it. And we went to, uh, we decided to go to Daytona Bike Week. And so we hop on there and we're riding to Daytona and we get down there. We spend a couple of days in Daytona and then we decided to go down to Key West because um, it was my 50th birthday. So I wanted to spend my birthday in the Keys and we did. And so as we're coming back from the Keys, we cut across the Everglades and we came up the Gulf Coast because my husband's, uh, my sister-in-law lives in Tampa. So we were going to stop and visit her on the way back. And um as we were getting close to her house, we stopped just like at a CVS or something. And, you know, I hadn't really been listening to the radio. I had my own custom playlist. And I, so I'm cruising the streets. I'm like, I'm in Florida. It's warm. It's sunny. Who cares about COVID, right? Um, and then we stopped somewhere. We were listening to the news and, and hearing all this stuff. And and that hearing about people hoarding toilet paper. And it was funny because my husband was pulling a little trailer behind his bike. And he said, I went into CVS to get something. And, and he said, well, while you're in there, you probably ought to check and see if there's toilet paper and buy some because who knows how much we have at home so you got to take it from florida and all so the way I, bought an eight pack of toilet, I bought an eight pack of toilet paper in Tampa, oh my god and i hauled that home and pl plus the all the extra to toilet paper rolls from the hotels the next three nights on the way home but um you know and 
I guess it just, it didn't seem real until I got back and my boss um, told me, you know, we're not coming back. And I'm an instructional technology coach now. So I actually, you know, I'm still technically a teacher, um, but I'm teaching teachers. And I had literally only been in this job three weeks. I barely, I didn't really know my job. <laughs> I was fresh yeah. out of the classroom and I'm like, uh, so how do I do my job? And um, so I was pretty much learning right along with all the teachers. Um, so we all the- had to learn. We, all, uh, we, we were given one week to learn a new platform and put lesson plans online. One week from the time yep. we left school to the time the kids uh, were required to go online. You know, it's funny you say you were at Bike Week. I was sitting at Bike Week at breakfast with Rhonda Brown and Ellie Rains, and uh, someone said that somebody from New York was was in Daytona at Bike Week with COVID, and it was like the whole restaurant came to a, a, you know, just got so silent, and uh, we left that afternoon. Um, So it, it was pretty freaky. Um, well, and they shut it down early, I think, didn't they? I yes, know we were, they did. Oh, we were in the keys when they shut it down, but yes. they shut it down early. Yes, they did. Uh, Fane, how about you? Um, so we were in school and started getting the rumors coming around that we might be closing. And by chance, luckily, like a week and a half before that happened, um, they had gotten a grant and we had just enough computers, uh, Chromebooks to go one-on-one one-to-one mm-hmm. so they said anybody want to come in the weekend and help clean them all down wipe them all down and get ready just in case and that we, I was in there Saturday helping out and Monday was when we were told we were going to go home right um, so we had the computer they were able to get all the computers out they had students come up to, to grab the computers um, we didn't go like this af- last year we went First period, second period, third period, everybody had to come to their, te- like a normal day online. That first year we didn't. I was doing everything I could to get students to just show up one day, see me for an hour. We'll talk about what you have to do and, you know, turn your cameras on because they don't like to turn their cameras on. And um, so it was like kind of like find your stuff. And I ended up finding a program that I really happened to yeah. like. And but not everybody did the same thing. Not right. everybody was in this, like you said, there was a platform, we didn't have that. So it was touch mm. and go, it was get what you can and do what you can. And um, yeah. and when you talk about like um, parent involvement and stuff, that first day, the first two days we were home, I made over a hundred phone calls home to parents. Mm-hmm. That was, that's what I did that day. This is what we're gonna do. This is what they should do, get it on Zoom. They should be getting in. And um, it was not fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was not. How about you, Diane? Well, since I work in the library, we were the ones that had to make sure all the computers were checked right. out yep. to all of the kids. And so there was that whole deal. And then they decided that that my phone would be the tech hotline. Oh, boy. So if any parents had problems or any students, they would call me and I was supposed to try to figure out what to do even though we have a tech department, but uh, so that was very stressful because mm-hmm. I didn't honestly know that much about, you know, the Chromebooks that we were using because mm-hmm. I was just basically doing library stuff. And then now all of a sudden I'm supposed to be able to help. Yeah. These parents. And I, I think that was uh, the hardest part too. I, I know uh, I'm pretty tech savvy and, but so many of our teachers are not, they really are not. And to throw everybody into that situation, but you know, like teachers always do, we found the resources, we found a way, mm-hmm. we we worked around it. We, uh, you know, I, I I ended up in the hospital October of 2020. It was so stressful, and mm-hmm. you know that was that was the red flag for me. And mm-hmm. I literally had the uh, doctor look at me, and she says, "What do you do like to do for fun?" I said, "Well, I ride my motorcycle." She goes, "Okay, then your prescription is to start riding your motorcycle more." Sweet. And well, I took it to heart, and you know, I we rode through COVID. We we being my wingman, Paul, and um, you know, what did you do? How did your motorcycle sort of uh, even out that that stress level? Anybody? It so does that for me. Mm-hmm. Wow. If, if I've had a really horrible day, I just get home, get on that bike and, and just go. And there's just something about it. Just 
being out in nature and, and feeling every change in temperature and, and humidity and whatnot, just being out there away from it all. Luckily, we are really close to just getting out of town because I don't like in town riding, but out on our county roads, it's so beautiful. And it's just you and your bike and nature. And it's what a stress relief. Well, and it's the perfect way to social distance. We, we did the same thing mm -hmm. too. I, mean, yeah. um, I was working from home and so, and I had never done that before as an educator. Um, and so there would be days I would text my husband. I just texted him a motorcycle emoji and he would get home and he, and he would open up the garage door. And he's like, getting the bikes out. We're, and we, mm -hmm. we live in town, unfortunately, but you know, we have a few little back roads and we would just ride to a little, a uh, little, little uh, bar and grill about 10 miles away, maybe and have a beer and a burger and come home. And just that was enough to be like, okay, I can get through tomorrow. Mm -hmm. right, go on. Yeah, I, I agree, Fane. Um, since it was in March and in New York, we don't have much riding season in March, but the nice thing is I am a part of a woman's group. So we would do Zoom meetings together and we would have that connection and that talk. Sometimes it's just chatting across in our little chat on Facebook as well. But those are the people that I communicated with the most were the motorcycle people. And you can start to you know, look forward to that summertime when you can get out there. Like you said, it's a perfect social distancing because you're on your bike, they're on their bike. We're not enclosed. We can go have a picnic somewhere so we can still be outside. And um, like Diane said, you get on the bike and everything's gone. All the worries, all the stress, I don't know what it is about it, but it goes away. It just flies away while you're on the bike. And the only thing I'm smiling, I'm listening to my music and I'm enjoying the time and the stress just goes away. Like, and then like, uh, like Tracy said, you can come back and okay, I, I got out there. I was able to get out in nature. I was able to get out in the wind to just forget everything. And then I'm ready for tomorrow. Sort of ready tomorrow. Tomorrow, I don't want to do tomorrow, but <laughs> I can't do it tomorrow. No, well, not just March, but it, because quarantine lasted all spring and, right. and summer here, yeah. and um, I ended up taking care of my then 16-month-old grandson on top of teaching because uh, my daughter's a nurse on the COVID floor. My grandson, uh, son-in-law, is in IT at a big uh, supermarket chain here in Florida. So they were fortunately both working and she called me and said, mom, what am I going to do? I said, well, you're going to bring little man over here to me and he'll, he'll hang out with Mimi. So I had that on top of trying to, uh, you know, initiate that online. And uh, it was, it was a struggle, but thank God there was my bike parked in the, uh, mm -hmm. in the garage. You know, we talk about our social emotional health. Here's, here's one thing I want to hit on. I, when the kids came back this year, Mm -hmm. um, I had them do a writing exercise and really some of their comments just about brought me to tears. So many of our kids lost family members mm -hmm. due to COVID. Mm -hmm. And um, I hadn't connected with that. Maybe I shouldn't have or wouldn't have done the writing exercise, but I think it was good for them to even write about it. I didn't make anybody mm -hmm. talk about it, but they were able to write about it. And what really got me was so many of them lost grandparents, you know, and, and me being a grandparent, it just, it just killed me. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I've seen our kids struggle with social emotional health. What have you seen? Oh, yes. Lots. I mean, when the school started in again, wow, we saw behaviors mm -hmm. that we haven't seen before. And just kids that are so upset and so angry and, and the, and, you know, elementary, they're little, right? So you don't they don't know why they're, they're upset and angry. They don't know how to process it. And I think years from now, we will have some, some, uh, you know, academic studies done on the impact of this pandemic on our, our education system, on the system, on the kids, on this, uh, you know, teacher shortage uh, that we're experiencing across the country. Right now, we don't have those studies. And right now, you know, I'm looking at, at kids who, like you said, the behavior, um, they don't quite know how to talk to even their peers uh, mm -hmm. anymore. I think they were so isolated for a while. And uh, I see a lot of immaturity, especially in the boys, especially in the boys. 
Fiend, you're at an all boys school. All boys school. <laughs> oh Lord, <laughs> how do you do that? Oh my goodness, I some of my. Some of my boys are just like six foot tall toddlers. Oh right yeah, now. they're absolutely they're they're huge. Just they tower over you. You know, and you have to get up there, rah, 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 you know, and I'll get on them. And um, it was funny because at first, when we first came back, it was like maybe the calm before the storm, but they were happy to be there. They were so mm-hmm. happy to be back in school, relieved to become to come back in school. And then after the first few weeks. The behaviors were coming out as well. Mm-hmm. Like they weren't, they they didn't know how to deal with everything and deal with deal with school again. And then you're on a schedule, and again you have to do this mm-hmm. again. Yeah. And um, they they're struggle. They're, it's still a struggle to get through that. Um, I've kind of changed. It kind of changed my approach. I mean, mm-hmm. I know we have regents towering over our heads, regents exams and stuff. But you know what? Un- unless you're connecting with them emotionally, unless you're dealing with that, unless you're helping them learn how to learn, you're not mm-hmm. going to get to the content. Mm-hmm. And because our regents have been like last year, they canceled regents, they canceled our January regents, which is really, it is a godsend because mm-hmm. you can deal with what needs to be dealt with right now. And it's not how to do something geometrically or algebraically. I mean, that comes into it, but they need so much more. So yeah, and then I'm I'm happy to hear you say that because I have uh, loosened my um, traditional approach to test mm-hmm. prep, state test prep, and I've told parents if they have a C or a D in my class, it's okay. Mm-hmm. It's okay. I'm not putting them or myself under pressure to excel. Um, I, I think they first and foremost have to learn to be students again in a mm-hmm. face-to-face classroom. And I hope we don't get caught. I mean, you are already online again, Fane. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we have not, but I just, uh, this year is, I wish they would cancel our state testing. I don't mm-hmm. think it's going to happen, but how can they be valid? How can right. they be valid the last, the last two and a half, three years? There is and just they, no they never have canceled it here in Texas. We've had it every year and it's, it's a joke right now. It really is. Yeah. yeah. It's nobody's yeah. priority. No. Well, and you know, in the state of Florida, they've also canceled bonus money for teachers who have students who demonstrate learning gains. So it's like, okay, what's my incentive this year? And the kids can say the same thing too. What's my incentive? Uh, and I just hope that more and more educators see that as the the correct approach to this this school year, not forcing kids to to learn um, for the sake of state testing. You know. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's impacted our district is um, a lot of our families had to move. I live in a, um, our county is next to uh, Disney, the Orlando area. It's a lot less expensive to live in our county than it is in that area. And we, what we have is a lot of parents who are in the service industry, you know, hotel, motel, maids, oh, right. cooks, uh, you know, minimum wage jobs. It, they really struggled. They really struggled during the pandemic. I mean, Disney shut down and uh, so did a lot of the hotels and so forth. So we had kids who literally, you know, struggled, um, kids who count on free lunch, free breakfast. Mm -hmm. What's it like in your district? We also have um, very low income and high, wow, high transient population. Mm -hmm. We kids come and go, come and go, come and go. And Mm -hmm. that is a big deal. The free breakfast, we have free Mm -hmm. breakfast, snacks, lunch, snacks again. So even all through pandemic, we had those, all that food available for families Mm -hmm. to pick up. Yeah, we we had a drive-through at school Mm -hmm. with, uh, for lunches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fane, how about you? Yeah, they had the same thing, but it wasn't so much coming right to the school, but the district, you know, the whole mm-hmm. um, the whole district had different locations where parents could go and pick up lunches and pick up breakfasts um, as well. Um, and Tracy, you weren't in a classroom, but what, what was your experience in that respect? Well, <laughs> what's funny is I wasn't in the classroom then. We were helping uh, get out technology, but um, it, so like a thing was saying they were lucky to have enough on campus we didn't have enough in the district they would they purchased massive amounts and so we were going out to campuses and helping distribute technology and even now 
um, we're really struggling with the, that new Omicron now. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because as um, as as uh, Thane was just talking, I got a text message and I glanced over at my iPad um, because our district is so short on, we have so many teachers out and so mm -hmm. many subs out, they've started pulling district personnel. I was in a high school good. class on Monday. <laughs> um, yeah, but me in a high school classroom is not good. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I just got a text message. I'm going to be at some campus tomorrow. I'm not sure yet whether it's it's not one of the campuses I service. So I'm not sure whether it's elementary or middle school, but or high school. But um, yeah, so, so you know, and, and I don't mind helping. I absolutely don't mind helping the struggle with it for us now is that we're still also expected to do our full-time job. Right. So of I have, I, yeah, I have a conference. I have three presentations in a week that have to be given that two of them are still undone because I've been teaching. Um, and so it's like, you know, if you have a conference period, then you can work on it for an hour, but you know, then I have, otherwise I have to come home and work on that. So, you know, I that's, a, that's feel a the struggle and, and the kids yeah. too. I mean, the kids in the class that I was in on Monday, They've been back from uh, Christmas break for two weeks and they haven't seen their regular teacher and they were frustrated. Right. And I gave them about 20 yeah. minutes, first 20 minutes of class to just vent. And I said, you know what? I understand. I, and and I, I, don't, I can't fix this problem for you, but I understand. I can empathize with you and we're going to do the best we can to get through today because they didn't have subs. So they've had a different person in the room every day. So I was just, well, you're, yeah, you're, the person of the day. Me. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that is a good segue. I just had a conversation with another educator here. And um, I think the narrative needs to change. You know, when uh, you get the email that says you must do this tomorrow, your, your immediate answer is yes. Yes, I can do that. And isn't that what we all say? Isn't mm -hmm. that what we all say? It, mm -hmm. Every time you dump something else on my plate, I accept it, I execute it, I get results. So I get dumped on again. Uh, when is that going to change for educators? When is that going to change? Soon, I hope. <laughs> it's not going to have... change until we change it. And that's that yeah. was my heated discussion with this other educator is, um, you know, her, in a nutshell, her comment was, I don't necessarily want more pay. I want this, this, this. And she listed all the support services that mm -hmm. most of us are, you know, hard pressed for right now. And I said, stop right there. That is exactly the problem. We, we mm -hmm. teachers have sacrificed our, our financial worth for the greater good of, of the, the whole school of the students. And I'm, I'm not sure that narrative is going to continue to play out. I mean, it's, it's, it's time we said, hey, enough, enough. And I think you're right. And, and I'm already starting to see some of that change with some of the younger teachers. I had, um, you know, I've only been in this position for two years, but the last year that I was in the classroom, I had a student teacher and she has already left the profession. Mm -hmm. And she and I were talking last night. And a lot of it was because just, you know, it was so difficult. And I said, her name is Amber, sweet girl. I said, you know, Amber, being a first year teacher is hard under the best of circumstances. Mm -hmm. I said, you started under the absolute worst. 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 I said, yeah. I just couldn't even, I said, if I had started when you started, I probably wouldn't be teaching anymore either. No. I said, I probably would have ran, ran screaming the other direction. Well, and I think when, when these we, younger people aren't going to stand for it. They're going to be like, you know what, if this is how it's going to be, I'm out. Mm -hmm. Well, I, and I hope you're right. Yeah. I hope you're right. Because Hopefully that'll be a wake up call. I, right. I hope so too. We all know there's a national teacher shortage and we mm -hmm. all know the answer is pay us what we're worth. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem to be coming down the pike anytime soon though. So, you know, when we think of our own administrations, what can administration do for us, you, this week, this month, this semester, mm -hmm. to make you a more effective teacher, to take some of the, the stress off of you. Diane, I know you're not in the classroom, but but you I, might you know you might be able to answer it from the opposite side. I know, you know what I was just teachers. gonna say that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> since since I was a teacher, I, I know how hard it is. And so honestly, every day I think what can I do to help the teachers in my building do their job better? And so I instituted several things, you know, just in the library, you don't have to know all those, but, but that's really what I try to do. I try to make it easier for these teachers. I bring them books. If they need books on a certain subject, I just say, tell me the subject, I'll find them. I'll bring them to you. I 
when we get a new kid, I make sure they get their computer for that kid as soon as I get that email. You know, I just I just try to be really on top of everything mm-hmm. for them. And and if I can make their life a tiny bit easier, that is makes me feel good. And, and I we, do a lot of that in, in my in my role too, because when I'm out, I have 10 campuses that I support. So I go from campus to campus. Right now, because of Omicron, we're not um, because I'm going to campuses to teach. But um, you know, when I'm on the campus in my role as as as, as instruction digital instructional coach, um, you know, I go and tell my teachers, you know, what can I do to make your job easier. Even if, you know, I have a teacher, you can tell her having a bad day. I'm like, do you need to go get a cup of coffee or something? And they're like, well, my conference period is not till such and such time. Do you need to go get a cup of coffee? Mm-hmm. Go to the lounge, get a cup of coffee. I will take your class for the next 15 minutes, leave. And, you know, it's just, you know, I think that administrators could do that too. Really come to them and say, what can I do? Not here's what I need you to do. What can I do for you? Thank you. And mm-hmm. that's what they're telling me is that no one's asking them that. No. No. Fane, you're in the classroom. I'm in the classroom. And um, one of the things I can say about our schools, we have a student manager for every grade level. So, um, and some of our grade levels have 90 students. Some of them have 70 students, just depending on grade level. And our student managers are very helpful when it comes to like I'm high school. So I have ninth to 11th grade. So if I have, um, you know, a behavior issue, which a disruption issue, they are very supportive in that. I can, I give them a text, hey, so-and-so is doing this. Could you come grab them for a minute? And they pull, take them out. And that in itself is huge because this is the first school I've been at that actually had that type of um, support in that way. Um, you know, talk about putting in our own funds and what we do. Uh, beginning of the year, I have my students. I buy them each a notebook, I buy them each a folder, and I give them each a pencil (laughs) for math class. And this is your first notebook because a lot of students just aren't prepared. So I do that, but that's not inexpensive, you know, to do that. Um, So that's that's one one support. And and I'm not saying the the school should support all of notebooks and everything like that either. But to um, one of the things with, the absences is we are asked to cover classes. So we have our full schedule and then we're asked to cover a class for our during our planning period. So that gives us lunch. And we could be in a seventh grade class. We could mm-hmm. be in a 10th grade class. We could be in an eighth grade class. We don't know until that morning. And, um, and that's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. And you and I like, had this like had this conversation on day, Facebook. After yeah. day. It's like yeah. if it's once a week, okay, but it became every day because that can't it, you can't sustain that. You it, can't sustain the, it. The, that kind of policy makes education and educators unsustainable. Right. And we can't, we can't keep doing that. You know, um, I want to wrap up our conversation uh, with on a positive note. What can parents do? What can parents do to contribute positively to a teacher's classroom? Um, Like for some of the parents I have right on my phone, got their text, got their phone number and text right back. And it's nice when they say, if anything's going on, you text me that moment because Mm -hmm. I will talk to him in that moment. So just having the support of respect the classroom. This is what you're supposed to be doing in the classroom and, and doing that. Now with it, with us being at home this week, sometimes parents are home. Many parents work evenings, work nights, overnights. Other times they're not. So checking on them, I think to, um, to make sure they're doing what they should be doing as well. Give, giving, giving that support, giving that um, the extra from home. This mm-hmm. is a team. This is a team. Mm -hmm. And many parents are like that. We have many parents at our teams and some some students kind of go through the cracks for maybe mom's work in two and three jobs Mm -hmm. and she just is exhausted Mm -hmm. by the end of the day. So it's tough on her as well. But I think just continually saying what value, that it's valuable to go to school and learn and to, to do that and to see the value in that. I think that's the hardest part because we're, we're also fighting games, right? <laughs> they got all of their games and yeah. this, and how do you teach, you know, 
Pythagorean theorem when they want to play their game. You know, you've, you've got that on top of it too. Yeah, that's, that's if they're at home. <laughs> you know, and I, I agree with you. That would be the one thing I, uh, unfortunately, I have 167 students. You have on, a lot of students. On my yeah. roster this year. And um, I probably have about 10% of those parents who are involved and supportive. And mm -hmm. there's something wrong with that. There is definitely something wrong with that. Um, I, I, my wish is for parents to step up to the plate and make education a priority at home. And, uh, you know, I was a single mom too, raising two daughters. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's not a lot of excuses I will accept for not being involved in your child's education and, you know, taking responsibility for it. Diane, how, would, how can parents help? Yeah, um, the one thing I really wish is that the parents would read to their little ones because mm -hmm. what a difference that makes. Yeah. I know yeah. exactly which kids, you know, have have that at home and, and so many don't. And it's just a small mm -hmm. little thing, but it really, really makes a difference. And just, yeah, um, 100%. tell your children how important school is and how important reading is and books and it's not just all games all the time and, mm -hmm. and YouTube and all that. Well, unfortunately, our generation of parents that I'm dealing with right now, you know, are the kids who didn't like reading and uh, were introduced to social media in their teens and the parents themselves are constantly on their phone. I, I think that's that's a generational thing. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. Read, 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 read. Mm -hmm. Tracy. Um, I, I got to agree. As, as someone who's a former reading teacher, and I'm actually studying to eventually become a literacy specialist. Um, so yeah, that's near and dear to my heart. But what I'm seeing is, you know, in, like I said, in my role, I'm not in the classroom on a daily basis, but we do, we have had a lot of interaction with parents. And so many times the parents um, they don't, you know, they're not, they're not involved on a daily basis. If they, you know, they, they call us, if there's an issue, you know, somehow they get routed to us because there's a technology issue. But when I ask them, so what did the teacher, you know, tell you about, oh, well, I haven't talked to her. Okay. Well, you know, a lot of the problems they are ones that if you had just asked the teacher, she would have explained this to you. And, and, and like Diane said, you can completely see when I'm on campuses, I can completely see the parents who are involved in their kids' education, mm -hmm. the parents who read to their kids or mm -hmm. ask them to read. And, you know, I, in the classroom myself, I always told a parent, you know, if I had a, if they had a struggling reader and they'd say, well, I never liked reading myself. And I'd say, please don't tell your child that. Please don't <laughs> tell oh, them. Oh, I've heard they it too. They don't like math. I can't That's, do math. I get that all the yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Or, or I wasn't good at math as a kid. So I understand who he's not math. No, that doesn't No, It's not genetic. It's not genetic. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's not. I was horrible at math. My kids are great at it. It's not genetic. They didn't catch it from me. I agree. <laughs> Ladies, I, I'm going to, um, I'm going to wrap it up here, but I'm, I'm going to stop our recording, but I want you to stay on a little while. And I really appreciate you joining this uh, solo chat with me. I hope we've solved some of the problems in education and at least given some of the uh, viewers something to think about. So I'm going to end it here, but hang around.